Hello everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here again for our MCAS video series. This video series is going to be about ecosystems and this first one is going to be about how biotic and abiotic factors affect ecosystem carrying capacity. In this video we're going to talk about both what biotic and abiotic factors are as well as looking at a few different models of how they will influence the populations uh, within a given ecosystem. So here we go. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what is a biotic factor. And so a biotic factor is any living component that affects the population of another organism or the environment. So basically the living things within the ecosystem. And so what we have over here on the left hand side is an image of an aquatic ecosystem. And what I can see up here is a phytoplankton and phytoplankton are a classic producer. And so they take in sunlight and convert it into uh, carbohydrates. Uh, they undergo photosynthesis. And as a result of it going through photosynthesis, it's going to be a producer for this ecosystem. You can see that these are eaten by zooplankton. And then the zooplankton are consumed by things like fish, like an Arctic cod, or by carnivorous zooplankton. And we will see all of the different organisms that will branch out as a result. So one of the key things that we talk about here within biotic factors are clearly feeding relationships. And those feeding relationships are things like what is a producer, what is a consumer, what's a primary consumer, like our herbivorous zooplankton, what's a secondary consumer like our arctic cod, or our tertiary consumer like a harbor seal. So these are all examples of different feeding relationships, how different organisms feed on other ones. Another thing that we can talk about within this particular diagram is the idea of competition. So one of the things we can look at here is that when it comes to consuming the arctic cod, there are arctic birds, there are harbor seals, there are polar bears, there are ringed seals, and there are harp seals. All of those are things that feed on arctic cod. And so there's competition for that particular food resource. What happens to the individual populations within these groups will affect the other ones. So for example, let's say that something comes along and it becomes a disease within the polar bear community. And all of a sudden now we wipe out the polar bears. What's going to happen to the other populations here? Well, we can see that harbor seals, in addition to competing with the Arctic cod, are also fed upon by the polar bears, as are the ring seals. So what you might imagine is both harbor seal and ring seal populations might escalate and go up as the polar bear population goes down. So competition for resources and how one organism interacts with others is going to play a crucial role within these ecosystems. Another thing that we can look at is the idea of symbiosis. And symbiosis is one of three different types of relationships. And I like to refer to these as good, 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 neutral, and good, bad. And so up on the top, what we see is we see a buffalo and we see some birds that are on the back of that buffalo. And what's happening is the buffalo are uh, have these birds that are sitting on top and the birds are consuming uh, flies or bugs that would normally harm the buffalo. So the relationship between the bird and the buffalo is an example of symbiosis in that it is mutualism. Both organisms, both the bird and the buffalo are getting a benefit from this relationship. The buffalo is being protected by uh, potential pests and the birds are being provided a source of food. The relationship in the middle, if you look very closely at that whale's tail, you'll see these barnacles right out in here on the very end. And so the relationship between the barnacle and the whale, we refer to as a good neutral. The barnacle get, as, gets a benefit from this relationship. The whale is going to have these barnacles attached to it, and it doesn't seem to harm the whale in any way to have these barnacles attached to the outside, but it also doesn't get a benefit from this as a result. But the barnacles get a free ride, and they get carried and water rushing over them, which provides them the ability to filter that water and get food. So the barnacle benefits, the whale's unaffected. We refer to this as commensalism. And then on the bottom, we have a relationship here, and I've got three examples of deer tick. And deer tick, just like any other tick, ticks latch on to a host and they suck the blood out of that host. We refer to this as parasitism or a good relationship for the tick, a bad relationship for the host. And so whether that host is a dog or a deer or a human, we end up seeing that the host is going to be harmed, whereas the tick or the parasite is being benefited.
cod population back over here in our food web. If all of a sudden there was a disease that spread amongst the Arctic cod and the Arctic cod population plummeted dramatically and it went down from a 100% to 25% of its current population because of this disease wiping it out, how would that affect the population? Well, obviously, the population of Arctic cod is being cut in half, but you would also imagine that the Arctic birds are going to be wiped out. Their predominant food source is being decimated. The polar bears and harbor seals and ring seals and harp seals, we're not going to be able to sustain nearly as many of those individuals in the population if the Arctic cod population goes down. We might see a boost in the carnivorous zooplankton and the herbivorous zooplankton. And the reason for that is as those populations' main predators disappears, now they're going to be able to spread out and feed a lot more. And so as a result, we might see an increase in Arctic char, and it'd be hard to know what would happen to the capelin because the capelin relies on both uh, the Arctic char and other organisms that rely on the Arctic cod. So that now gets into a much more complicated case. So what we see is disease may influence the population by causing a decline, and then it also has an impact on the other organisms within the ecosystem that compete with or rely on that species as a biotic factor. All right, we're going to contrast that with abiotic factors. And an abiotic factor is a non-living condition or thing such as climate or habitat that influences or affects an ecosystem and the organisms in it. So over here, we have a picture of Massachusetts. And within Massachusetts, we're describing the different climate types you see within Massachusetts. And this Copen climate type is going to refer to temperature and humidity and also a little bit about the wind patterns that you get, specifically from the oceanic uh, climate type that we look at there. All right, so when we think about uh, abiotic factors, we're, we're really going to think about those non-living factors uh, such as temperature and humidity and availability of water. But we're also going to think about the climate events that take place, such as natural disaster and availability of resources. So one of the things that we think about here is things like hurricanes or snowstorms or ice storms and how these factors can all influence a given ecosystem. Uh, the availability of water within a given area is going to be crucial. And so when we think about the weather events, something like a snowstorm or an ice storm or hurricane comes along, these are non-living factors, but they can actually kill large numbers of organisms present in an ecosystem. They're also going to influence the availability of water um, and other raw nutrients that may be available later. So one of the things that we often think about in the winter is our snowstorms and how terrible and awful it is to maneuver around within a snowstorm. But you also have to think that snowstorm is providing water. And if we have a very dry winter, it actually will influence as an abiotic factor what can grow that next summer because a low amount of snow will lead to a low amount of available water. These abiotic factors are going to ultimately contribute to the competition we saw in the previous slide by those biotic factors for things like water and when the growing season will start and when the growing season ends and where the food availability will be and when mating seasons could take place. So the abiotic factors will play hand in hand with those biotic factors and will help determine how many organisms can survive in a given habitat and also for how long they can survive within that habitat. All right, so let's talk about what a carrying capacity is. And what we'll look at here in this lower diagram, and this is a simulation that is from John Darko. So I'll put the link down here uh, to the John Darko website. And this allows you to manipulate various factors within the ecosystem to see how many individuals you can have survive in a given habitat. And really, that's what carrying capacity is. Carrying capacity is the maximum population size of a species that an environment can sustain indefinitely given the food, habitat, water, or other necessities available in the environment. And so what we see here in the John Darko model is this is for population dynamics of white-footed mouse. And what we see is the relative amount of water, the availability of chipmunks, because chipmunks are a prime competitor, the availability of hickory mastings, the average litter size, meaning how many babies they're going to have, the temperature, the availability of predators, how big an area they are, and how many 
mice do we start with initially? And depending on those factors, and you can, if you go to the simulation, uh, play with those levers, you will actually determine different carrying capacities for the mouse population. And so that's one way that you can model carrying capacity. And another way you can think about carrying capacity is by looking at historical data. So this is the sea level rise within the coastline for the state of Massachusetts. And this uses data from as early as the 1920s all the way up into, I think this is actually uh, to 2015 was the most recent data set that they included in this. And what it does is it shows you the trend of historical data. Now, this is just one abiotic factor, but uh, sea level rise will have a huge impact on coastal ecosystems. So if you were a coastal plant, let's say, and your habitat is going to be in between the sand dunes and the ocean, and you see the sea level rising each generation, this will lead you to the understanding that you're going to have a loss of habitat, and a loss of habitat will reduce carrying capacity. Uh, in other instances, maybe you are in a coastal community and you are something like a barnacle and you are on the rocks and the, you are going to have as the sea level rises an increased potential area where your population can spread out because as the sea level rises more of those rocks are covered by seawater and therefore there's a greater potential habitat for you. So these are examples of how different populations will be impacted by changes to these abiotic factors. And this is a good example of historical data and how that historical data will allow us to make some predictions about what's going on and where things are going. All right, so at this point, hopefully you could analyze a data set to support explanations of biotic and abiotic factors and how they affect carrying capacity. Uh, you should be able to give specific examples of biotic factors, such as feeding relationships, symbiosis, competition, and disease. You should be able to give examples of abiotic factors that include climate, weather, natural disasters, and availability of resources. And lastly, you should be able to look at a simulation and make some predictions or draw some conclusions. Similarly, you should be able to do the same with historical data. All right, I hope that was helpful and I'll talk to everybody soon.